we're going to get the show on the road. Uh, before we uh, kick things off, I, we thought some quick introductions about the organizations and the individuals on today's webinar would be pertinent uh, for that. I'm going to turn things over to one of my esteemed co-presenters today, Stan Bochnak of ABM. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here today. Um, just a little background about ABM and ABM parking before we get into the who's who and who's doing what today. Uh, and most of you are familiar with ABM as one of the leading providers of facility solutions across the United States of America. Uh, and within that comp within that group is the ABM parking, uh, which is we're talking about today, ABM parking services, uh, which provides transportation services and a variety of different parking operations from coast to coast. We're one of the largest uh, in the United States with over 1,800 locations locations and collecting billions of people's money, well, maybe a little less now post-COVID, but uh, we're going to get back there. Everybody is in the industry. And uh, we've been around since 1967, almost as long as I've been around. And uh, we're glad to be a part of this. And we're glad to be a part of, in this time, uh, ABM as a whole. It's a well-diversified, financially strong company, allowing us to continue to grow even during these challenging times. So uh, we've been working with uh, Smarking since 2016. We can talk a little bit about how we've been using them and that utilizing it to maximize revenue in the facilities and using Smarking dynamic pricing. Um, and one of the case studies or several that we'll be talking about today. Uh, in the group today, um, I would like to introduce Matt Andrews. He's our branch manager in Chicago region. Uh, he's been with the company for several, more than several years now and uh, handling everything in the uh, Chicago uh, Midwest area. Myself, I've just been introduced as the National uh, Vice President of National Parking uh, Sales. Brian Bush is the Regional Vice President overseeing the Midwest and the East Coast, one of the largest regions uh, in the company. He's been with the ABM for longer than I can remember, <laughs> longer than I've been there. So uh, I've been working with Brian for a long time. And then we'll bring back to, to you, Cassius. Thanks, Dan. Yep, my name is Cassius Jones, uh, head of national accounts here at Smarking. Been with the firm for just over five and a half years now, so it's been a, it's been a great ride, uh, gentlemen. I can't tell you how excited we are to be presenting with you today. Um, one of our very valued clients and partners. Uh, so thanks so much for taking some time and uh, sharing with folks in the industry about some of the good work that we've been doing. Uh, before we dive into sort of different revenue recovery strategies um, during and after uh, the COVID recovery, uh, I thought, you know, I'm a big fan of context and uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile just to touch on what makes parking an attractive asset class to begin with to form the foundation of our of our discussion. Um, one of the things that comes up the most when you when you think about parking as a as a real estate asset class is just the steady and recurring cash flows associated with garages and lots. Even in a depressed environment like today, parking revenues are still flowing in and providing much needed cash flows for asset owners, especially from rents from tenants, especially in impacted industries like retail, um, are, are, could be difficult to collect. Looking forward, we see parking as key urban infrastructure for all major markets and ver verticals. To put it plainly, folks, parking as an asset class is not going anywhere. During the pandemic, we've seen new car sales increase, and in New York City, we're seeing a shift from transit to personal vehicle trips. In markets like China and Australia, which are well ahead of the US in terms of COVID recovery, parking volumes are already back at 2019 levels. Here in the States, we expect parking volumes to steadily recover throughout 2021 and should be a solid stream of income for asset owners well into the foreseeable future. Today, while the market is down and recovering slowly, there are some markets that are doing better and some facilities that are doing better than others. As of Feb 2021, the average garage and lot in North America, uh, their peak occupancy is 21%. Now this is based on Smarking's industry benchmark, which is anonymized data across more than 2,500 parking locations across the US and Canada. Uh, we do a lot of work with ABM across uh, the U.S. in regions like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Cleveland, um, and we've uh, grouped ABM's locations in New York City together in order to understand how they've been doing relative to the market. So the market's peak occupancy is currently sitting at 21% for ABM's portfolio in New York City. Peak occupancy is averaging 67%. They're, as a whole, these locations are beating 86% of the market in North America. So they've just been doing an absolutely fantastic job making lemonade out of lemons 
uh, and we're really excited to share with you today some of the strategies that enable that outperformance. Uh, we figured what better way to showcase those strategies than to hear it from the experts themselves. Um, Brian, as Stan mentioned, oversees ABM's entire operation on the East Coast, and that includes New York. Brian, before we dive into these strategies, what other trends are you seeing in the market in terms of uh, parking as an asset class? Brian, sorry, you're, you're muted. Sorry, Brian, I, I, I still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. thank you, okay. yeah, awesome. About that. So I think we're seeing a, say, uh, a change in the consumer profile. Uh, you're, you're taking a look at these New York operations that we've talked at, uh, about in great detail. And we wanna take a step back, you know, when we we're, when COVID came upon us, you know, we have clients, we have vendors, we have, we have our bosses that are saying, what are we doing to fix it? How are we gonna recover? And when there's not a whole lot of activity going on, there's there's so much so much piece of the pie that you can share with with the entire parking market. So, you know, we thought we needed as many tools in our arsenal as possible. That's going to provide the best possible data for us to to analyze. And in, in, in throughout that process, we realized with our clients, the rule books were thrown out the window along with the budgets. So spaces and inventory that maybe have been were forbidden to use, they're saying sell whatever you have. We, we don't care. We're going to rely on you to make recommendations for rates. So it's it's something that it's um, when it's rolled out, you have to work it. You just don't set it and forget it. And in coupled with that, you know, you have to reach out to your your local parking industry equipment providers because the goal is to communicate to the general public that your facility is going to be safe to park with especially in certain markets where you are valet parking every car that enters your driveway. So how do we, how do we, besides the revenue approach, how do we deliver the message that we're safe? You know, we have an enhanced clean process for our parking facilities. You work with your parking equipment vendors. You, you talk about touchless payment processing, Bluetooth, LPR, ABI, just to name a few. It seems like every day there's something new hitting the market that's gonna benefit the consumer, either a payment process, or, or in regards to a safe, uh, safe parking experience in the, in the facilities. And and uh, Cash, if I may add, uh, Brian was talking about that too. I, I believe that um, the trends, as you were saying, is parking is key. It's not going away. And some of the things that we saw that were previously threatening our industry, if you will, or, or learning how to coexist with the Uber effect of, of, uh, and people um, using mass transit and different modes of transportation, some of that's going to continue, obviously, but in, certainly in, for a while, it's going to be very different. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I kind of half joke that it's, uh, it's like the, like everybody's putting house plants back in their house. The 70s are back in the sense that people are driving around again, right? And you're seeing right. more and more people. If you notice on your freeway or the expressway, whatever you call them, wherever you live, there's a lot of cars on the road for nobody being at work. Right? If we're all right. working from home. There sure seems to be a lot of people on the road, uh, which leads you to believe that trend is once those offices open up. That's going to be an you're going to see more and more of a use of that. And to Brian's point, it's going to be very fluid and it's going to change quite a bit. And you're going to have to work very closely and watch those trends uh, very, very closely. Stan, I, I think those are great points. I think one thing that we've seen is some of the most resilient assets uh, here during the COVID environment have been um, garages associated with uh, residential assets. Uh, if cars are not in office garages, right, where are they? Um, they're they're sitting. In a, in a residential oriented garage. And so uh, we're seeing more owners of residential real estate think critically about how to monetize the parking component. Uh, the other thing that's, that's been interesting is right, that shifts from public transit. And so uh, definitely seeing some tailwinds in New York City, uh, also seeing uh, similar trends in Chicago and Boston will kind of be interesting to see how those trends continue to play out here um, over the next four or five months. One thing that we've been seeing a lot of clients do, and, and ABM, uh, uh, you guys have been uh, sort of leading this charge, is uh, thinking about sort of like the digital transformation in parking. And I think that really starts with the parking access and revenue control system, right? All of the data that we collect at Smarking is uh, a function of, of those systems. And 
um, online reservations, mobile payments, and what have you. But Parks is really for a garage, sort of like the primary data source. Um, Matt, you've been uh, leading the charge for, for ABM in Chicago, uh, installing some new systems, but also working with some legacy equipment as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about sort of what you've been doing with your team in terms of maximizing the value from your parks equipment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think to piggyback a little bit on what uh, uh, Brian and, and Stan and yourself have been talking about, um, our, our major concern, uh, our issue uh, was that we have several different type of revenue control equipment throughout the entire country. Um, uh, those all have their individual ways of pulling data and getting that data out. Uh, typically, it, it either came out in a PDF form or non-editable uh, format. Um, we would have to charge our managers uh, to try to pull that data out, put it in something that's readable, uh, something that could give us data and feedback right away. Um, and as the emerging technology of online payments came on board, um, we saw a need there to streamline that process. And we were dealing with a lot of older equipment. So we reached out to our, our partners and our vendors and uh, asked for solutions. And uh, some had some, uh, some had older systems where, that just weren't capable of that. And we weren't ready for a full system upgrade. So we looked towards third parties to provide solutions uh, and create a, uh, a much more easier user interface, uh, which really um, kind of laid the, the foundation uh, pre-COVID for, for how quickly we were able to pivot into this new technology. And as I stated a little bit earlier, um, getting that data and that information out of older systems was very cumbersome and time consuming for our teams. And uh, at that point, you're looking at old data and you're trying to make adjustments in the garage uh, based on that older data. And um, that, that's just not very effective all the time to do that. So using the smarting platform, we found that it was gave us the ability to integrate with several systems, uh, probably the majority of systems that we have, and create a, a dashboard for us that aggregated everything into one location. And um, what that really led to was we were able to manipulate those uh, that information and data almost in real time and spot on. So, so what we were able to do is is pull up that information. And often, when you're looking at this information, it leads to more questions, right? You know, you, you go, okay, well, you know, this was the revenue on this day. Um, what was the duration of stay? And and that really starts to get you thinking. And instead of going back and trying to uh, get that Excel uh, sheet to give you the data you're looking for, uh, which again is very time consuming, you can actually do it with, with a click of a mouse and, and dive into other aspects of that. And I, I think we'll touch maybe a little further on of how we've taken advantage of that to really um, lead in, in the numbers that you're seeing in this presentation. Um, and you know, getting that granular data where, where we can actually see to, you know, week over week, month over month, year over year, uh, has been especially helpful uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, uh, Matt, that's that's fantastic. I know, you know, you mentioned uh, duration, right? I think that's one that's been the most interesting charts to, to look at in this marketing tool is just trying to observe sort of how parking behavior has changed seeing a lot of facilities move from sort of like nine hour durations to four hour durations. Is there an opportunity to change rates around there? The other thing that I'm a really big fan of taking a look at is sort of like changes in entry time, right? Are folks still gonna be coming into the office around seven, 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. or are we gonna have sort of like afternoon shifts? And so I think, yeah, I mean, your team has been expert in just taking a look at those two charts and uh, and really making the most of, of what parking demand there is. Um, Outside of uh, sort of like an asset optimization perspective, uh, you guys have been leveraging the tool from sort of operational uh, perspective as well. Matt, can you talk to us a little bit about how you've been able to leverage uh, smarking and, and real-time data to enable remote management and some of the fl flexibility and, and agile operations that you guys have been engaged in in Chicago? Uh, absolutely. I, I think one of the most important things for us during this time was really to find efficiencies and cost savings for our clients also to uh, maximize our employees' time if they're working from home or if uh, you know they do have an office that uh, it's not shared uh, in the field. And, and what, we, what we did is really gave that extra responsibility and access to those managers to spend time basically doing data analysis and pulling up additional locations. So by giving them additional uh, uh, 
uh, uh, ability to log in at other locations and view them. Um, you know, a lot of the managers I, I tasked with the ability to look at and see how those garages are performing on a day-to-day -day basis every day in the morning, pull that data, take a look at it, make suggestions for uh, changing online rates or uh, do we need to be more competitive on our, our specials and uh, does it make sense to have a higher evening rate or should we come down on those? And that really allowed our managers to be remote and still do a very high quality level of work and maximize um, as much revenue as they can for our clients. Brilliant. One of the things that we've seen uh, sort of play out during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, and this was a trend that was you know, in place not only in the parking industry, but in all industries um, pre-COVID is this shift uh to basically purchasing things from a from a digital perspective right we think of you know when was the last time we ever called up uh someone at an airline company to buy a, a plane ticket right all these transactions are going online and that that trend was underway in parking um but really accelerated during the uh the COVID 19 pandemic so i think this is one of the biggest trends that the abm team has been playing to their advantage um Put together a handful of numbers. Again, all of these are, are from Smartings Industry Benchmark uh, anonymized data across 2,500 locations in North America. Uh, the top section basically speaks to US visitor parking activities, i.e. entrances and exits into facilities, how many people are visiting parking facilities. Uh, this is across both contract and transient parkers, basically we drive up parkers uh, non-digital transactions. So uh, at the depths of the pandemic, you can see uh, the industry was down 95 spot 78% uh, as of uh, just this past week, actually, first week in February, the industry had recovered to down 66 spot 17. So that's an improvement of 29 uh, spot 61 or almost 30%. So we've recovered 30% off of the lows from a drive up non-digital transaction perspective. If you contrast that with what's happening from the online parking demand, uh, these are the online reservation applications, uh, taking a look at how those markets are fared. You can see uh, online parking demand a little bit more resilient, down 91% relative to 95 during the depths of the crisis in April. Um, those, uh, those transactions have rebounded uh, significantly faster than drive up transactions. Uh, we're seeing uh, online transactions down 50% nationally um, as of the first week in February. So a 40% recovery uh, in online parking demand. Um, I think you always got to skate to where the, the puck is going and it's better to have wind in your sails as it relates to, to headwinds. And the ABM team has been doing just a fantastic job of making the most of uh, rec the recovery in online parking demand across their portfolio. Um, we would encourage all of the attendees to think critically about uh, their online presence. Uh, this is a trend that we expect will not go anywhere. And having a, having a solid online and digital strategy is crucial um, to making sure that your revenues are optimized. We'll talk a little bit more about online parking demand uh, later in the presentation and some of the things that the ABM team has done in order to capitalize on that trend. That said, uh, drive up uh, contract parkers still still the meat and bones of, of any parking operation. Um, gonna hope uh, let Stan and Brian speak to some of the things right. that we've been seeing from a drive up perspective. Uh, Stan? Yeah, there definitely has been a shift in um, in the patterns. Um, it's still emerging. Uh, most of us are calling 2021 now a reset year as we're trying to figure things out. I mean, if you told me a year ago we'd be sitting here still in lockdown, I wouldn't have thought we'd be here, uh, but here we are. And uh, I think that's an important thing that we, we're starting to see. Okay, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a vaccine. There is, there is still this kind of push out of people going um, uh, back to work probably later in the year than we had really anticipated. Um, in the beginning of the lockdown, down, everything is shut down. We started seeing the patterns where people weren't buying them monthly. They were coming in maybe once or twice a day, once or twice a week, and buying daily passes versus their monthly canceling that. Um, and I think that's going to kind of still continue unless until things start picking up a little bit more. But I think what you're seeing is people maybe they will be sharing this parking spaces, which we've been hearing. What's interesting now is you're hearing more about people thinking about anticipating what's going to happen in the next 
year coming up as we start talking to people. But we've definitely seen it more as a shift. In, and thanks to working with you guys too and getting that data, not only operating in a vacuum of just our own locations and our own cities, we've been able to to apply that data that you've been supplying and saying, hey, yes, more people are using visitor parking than any other kind of parking right now. And that kind of goes hand in hand with what we've been seeing throughout the country. Some are open more, some parts of the country are open more than other parts. Um, definitely a change in the times people are coming. They seem to be coming in later, uh, leaving a little bit earlier, maybe just coming in for a shorter amount of time and work. And that's going to be fluid and change over time. So I think we're going to be seeing that. Hopefully, we're going to be seeing the bread and butter, like you said, the monthly parking for a lot of these facilities start picking up in the next few months. Uh, but you really are going to have to, and Brian will talk a little bit about this next, but really being aligned and, and watching what's happening with those trends. It's really, we're all in something completely new. Nobody, everybody's figuring out as we're going along. And if, and if I, you know, if anybody says they have all the answers this minute, I'd say, I'd I call uh, call call them out on it because everybody's just trying to figure out what's going on. But the key is the communication and kind of watching that data as it's moving along through 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 the this whole cycle that we're going through. Yeah, Stan, I think you hit it right in the head about the consumer makeup has changed. You know, certain properties we know we're attracting new customers. They could have been customers that were previously riding public transportation that we've converted to our locations. We know that. Uh, major employers that used to employ 500 people on one shift are now going to two shifts or multiple shifts, or they're going to be doing a combination of work at home and, and, and report to the office. And that's going to be always evolving. So we discovered in, 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 in some locations in Chicago where shortly after, after we started to see some little bit of recovery, we noticed that, you know, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays were now our nice days. We were, we were happy to see that. And that's, and that's changing from market to market to facility to facility. And certain locations are they're, they're positioned in a market where they're close by to major buildings. They're going to get their share of volume just because where they're located. But you also have to have the right rate. People are looking at rate, then they're looking at location today. So it's important that when you do receive your data, that you work with your managers to make sure they're making sound decisions on the data that's being provided. And I think it goes back to Brian too, as you were saying, like, but know thy market. Every city is a little bit different. Chicago, mm -hmm. New York are not Los Angeles and Houston, right? Where uh, it depends on how car, car dependent they are and how much of the capacity is. And those types of cities, particularly in the West and the Southwest, when they build built more on a suburban model versus the East Coast and parts of the Midwest, which are denser, uh, the rates can be a little bit, actually you can find yourself getting more aggressive rates on those areas, whereas mm -hmm. you could on other parts where it might be more competitive. It really is a, a market by market uh, for that solution. Agreed. Yes, Stan, I, I think I, I definitely agree with that in Chicago. I think we we see a more, um, the consumer is much more used to seeing online here. Uh, it's been around yes. a lot longer than the rest That's of the country. True. So yes. as we were seeing um, people that typically didn't drive in or wanted to stay away from public transportation, um, they, they are a little more conscious of price and they know that these other platforms exist. So they're gonna shop a little bit more. So that's, I think what really helps us is being able to um, see the pattern at these facilities and then make adjustments so we can try to capture as many of those uh, people in our garages. Thanks so much, gentlemen. We're, we've reached sort of the halfway mark here. Looks like we're right on time, uh, opening things up for our first round of Q&A. If you have any questions for Stan, Brian, or Matt, please go ahead and, and put them into the question box now. It does look like we have one or two uh, trickling in. Oop. So the first first one, uh, they're, they're asking you to break out your, your crystal ball. Uh, Mr. Andrews, I'm going to direct this one your way. Uh, <laughs> okay. if, you, if you could guess, when are we going to see uh, 2019 levels of uh, parking revenues and transactions uh, here in North America? Just, uh, just a month uh, and a year, if you could. Right. I've been asked that question quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I've always had an answer, uh, and it's always been wrong. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we saw here locally, we, we saw a nice little trend this summer, you know, things started to pick up pretty rapidly uh, after April and throughout the summer, and it, it gave us a lot of hope. Uh, and that, of course, bled into the 2020 budget season, and we tried to maintain that hope <laughs> uh, throughout throughout the year. And then uh, we, we had that kind of second wave uh, 
uh, come in and, and really affect it. So, you know, again, uh, I'm optimistic. I, I really think that um, springtime we'll see similar to what we saw last year, except in, an even larger increase. I think it'll be a little bit more confidence in people as more and more vaccines come out. But, um, you know, it, it again, it's, it's not going to be 2019 level, I, I think, really, honestly, until uh, the end of this year or early next year. Got yeah, it. Yeah, I think yeah, we're considering 2021 is the recovery year. It's uh, we've been fooled a couple of times, like Matt said. You know, we saw some some upward movement. We got a little spring in our step. We thought we we're we're on the way, and, uh, and then we have a relapse, and we're we're back to ground one. So it's very hard to predict, but I think it's really is paramount about how many vaccines get out there, and yep. if our consumers are comfortable returning to parking facilities. Right, that's key. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I've also been overly optimistic. I think this third wave uh, has been has been really punishing. That said, I think uh, this first week in February we did see a nice uptick in transaction volume. I think the big difference between this recovery and previous recovery is the vaccine. You can't say say enough about it. Uh, and so uh, we're hopeful that this trend is up and to the right. Uh, the pace of it, um, it remains to be seen. Uh, follow up question from the audience. Uh, any market that you expect to sort of lead. So if there's gonna be a city or a region that gets back to 2019 the fastest, uh, any any thoughts on that, Stan? I would definitely say, which we were talking about, the Chicago, Mar uh, Chicago New York, Boston markets where uh, there is less supply and probably more demand. So you would see those go up much faster uh, in those parts, anywhere there, it's, it's a it's a transit heavy uh, city. Probably San Francisco to a lesser extent, uh, but the, the cities on the East Coast where they're designed on those models, I would definitely see those leading the way, and then the rest of the country following. That's a a good observation, Stan. Right now, the data definitely um, confirms that in terms of where things stand right now. New York is our is the number one market in New York in uh, in the U.S. Uh, followed closely by Chicago and Boston. So some of these bigger, denser, more transient oriented cities definitely leading the way as of now, remains to be seen if they'll power our way out of the recovery. Um, getting back into today's, uh, the content of today's webinar, right? We're talking about strategies to recover revenues uh, and, and always trying to skate where the puck is going. One of the things that we've been uh, working on with ABM for actually for quite some time is implementing dynamic pricing uh, on your online channels, right? And so earlier I talked about that shift from uh, physical in-person transactions to digital transactions. And, you know, at Smartman, we're big fans of like taking a look at the airline and hotel industries and using those as a bellwether for where we think parking is going to go. One of the things that has been happening in those industries, right, outside of more digital transactions is just leveraging uh, variable and dynamic pricing strategies in order to better align uh, demand with supply. Uh, not only does this create better revenue outcomes for the supply side, the airlines and hotels and, and parking asset owners also actually creates a better consumer experience because you've got uh, more evenly distributed demand. Um, we've been working on our uh, automated yield management solution. This is a uh, algorithmic demand-based uh, pricing uh, program that Smartking developed back in 2018. ABM was one of our first clients uh, to adopt the solution uh, in, in the Big Apple, New York City, back in, in 2019. What the solution does is it is effectively automates the pricing uh, of parking on your online digital sales channels. Uh, it's an algorithm that's basically predicting demand and finding that optimal price point in order to maximize revenues and occupancy levels. A lot of times what I try to, how I, you know, uh, articulate this is, you know, if you had a one or two managers full time sitting there in a, in a uh, room with, you know, seven computer monitors constantly analyzing the behavior change, what have you, uh, aimed as exactly what they would do, right? Analyze when are the people coming entry time? How long are they staying? What's the right price point? Uh, quite frankly, team, right? This is a, this is a job that's better suited for a piece of software than a uh, human being and, and ABM has been leading the charge and adopting these sorts of digital solutions. And so uh, one of the more remarkable stories uh, ever since you know we saw uh, COVID impact to, to drive up 
and ABM was uh, keen on sort of making the most of uh, what demand was out there, going ahead and implementing these types of strategies more broadly in New York City. Uh, there's one location in particular that we want to highlight um, that, that's just had uh, absolutely incredible results actually going ahead and exceeding online revenues uh, uh, pre, pre uh, uh, pandemic. That said, uh, another thing before that I just want to touch on before diving into this individual location is is just like the nature of our relationship with ABM and how we've been working together to make sure that things are properly configured across all of the regions and all of the locations. And so while an algorithm is absolutely a fantastic tool in order to monitor and measure different changes, there is uh, a human component to this, right? An algorithm's not gonna know if there's a brand new construction site opening in, in two weeks and maybe we should go ahead and, and, and change those prices. And so one of the really great things about our relationship with ABM is, is sort of this many to many uh, working relationship. So not only am I on the phone with folks like Brian and Matt and reviewing results at a high level, but uh, the smarting team and the ABM team, even at the garage manager level, are constantly chatting, working to configure and optimize uh, the configurations of the program in order to make sure that um, the results are as good as they can be. And so um, we're, we're seeing sort of what the efficacy of that teamwork is uh, on this slide here. So uh, what we're taking a look at on, on this slide is effectively uh, online revenues at a uh, location that ABM manages in New York City. The dark blue bar basically represents what happened in 2020 and the lighter blue bar is the same month for 2019. We went ahead and implemented AIM here in March of 2020 after the pandemic, just looking to get started on some of those incremental revenues. April was a really tough month in New York City, but you can see coming out of uh, uh, May and, and into June of 2020, uh, revenues just climbing up and to the right. Uh, so in August of 2020, uh, the garage had generated just under $24,000 in revenues, net revenues on this channel in August of 2019, uh, 6,600 uh, in, in revenues. So that's a $17,000 beat. So implementing these types of strategies can be incredibly lucrative and do a lot to maximize revenues um, during, this, during this pandemic time. Brian, this is a location that's that's in your region. Any any commentary or thoughts on on what we were able to achieve together at this location? Well, I think it was important that we had buy-in from our from our managers, our branch managers, facility and operations managers, and it was an education process for everybody. And you have to get their buy-in, and they have to be uh, responsive. Um, you know, we we. We're oftentimes debating on, on phone calls about what the system is telling us what to do. And it goes against our every creed and our what we've learned in the parking world. We're not ever gonna do that, but you have to take that risk. You have to let the data speak for itself. You still have to make some sound decisions, having the buy-in and setting rates and you watch. Like if we set a rate on a Friday, we can't wait to come in on Monday and see how that rate performed over the weekend. And you have to keep, keep nurturing it along uh, but I think it's ever so critical that if you roll this out, that you have to have buy-in from top to bottom. Right. The other thing that I think really separates ABM uh, and, and, and you guys just do an exceptional job and speaks to sort of our, our relationship uh, is just how you guys are able to uh, combine different feature sets. So uh, you've heard me talk a little bit about our industry benchmark and how we can use that in order to understand where the market is. Uh, another effective way of leveraging the industry benchmark is sort of like understanding relative performance, right? And so here on, on this page, you see sort of uh, off-street New York facilities, what's happening from a revenues perspective, and then you can take a look at what this, loca this ABM location is able to do, right, just in terms of an outperformance perspective, uh, pretty spectacular. Matt, your team in Chicago has been very successful in leveraging this tool in, in order to uh, work with your clients. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a fantastic tool. I, I think uh, you know most uh, parking people and parking operators. We we have a pretty good uh, uh, pulse on what's going on in our areas. We know when bridges are out and traffic's diverting, and we can usually see that impact on P and Ls, and we understand that. But you don't get a sense of the larger market as a whole. And uh, when COVID came, you know, hit and impacted us, we had to pretty much throw the budgets out the window. Um, and 
you know, so we had to find other ways to articulate, you know, what we were seeing in the garage, how it compared to budget, but also how did it compare to the industry of what's going on and being able to get, you know, data on a national level and then more granular uh, in a, like a Chicago market or New York uh, in that region and have a sample of uh, different garages and locations all aggregating into there, letting us know how the basic performance of the market is. We can then, you know, uh, give that information to our clients. We can let them know where the market is, and then we can show them how they're performing to that market. And I think that's really important for asset managers and property managers to know that while the numbers might not be hitting those budget standards that we put forward or what we saw in 2019, we can still give them a, a sense of confidence that we, we know what's going on in the market and their garage is still performing either where it should be or above uh, the industry in, in the area. Yeah, um, Matt, thanks so, thanks so much for that. I, I like, you know, such a big fan of sort of like understanding relative performance. It's just been so key during this pandemic, you know, for the most part, everybody's down, but the question is, right, are you are you down more or less than the benchmark and, and being able to use that benchmark in order to forecast these trends, but then also understand, okay, well, if in a location is outperforming, are there uh, tools that we can leverage in order to sort of translate that success over to um, uh, other locations? Um, here's uh, two of our key uh, bench uh, markets. You can see here, uh, Basically, the month, year-over-year uh, -year performance on a monthly basis for both Chicago and New York. Uh, we talked a little bit about how this third wave has been implicating things, right? So here's the recovery that we've seen in the market. This was the good old days of September 2019. Um, things were ripping and roaring in Chicago, and then obviously, as this third wave of cases came, um, right, we're we're sort of on the downswing. Been a pretty healthy recovery in Chicago. Uh, January relative to December, which is which is exciting. Um, taking a look at New York, uh, New York definitely still stronger than Chicago, down 38% on average relative to down 67. But um, haven't seen that quickening pace of the recovery like we did in Chicago. Taking a look at this data, monitoring things, measuring things, forecasting them out is going to be crucial uh, moving forward. We've just got one last uh, slide uh, for folks today, and then uh, a bunch of folks have been uh, asking questions. And so I'm going to uh, look to get through this slide quickly and then uh, turn things over to the experts at EBM to hopefully answer as many questions as possible. Uh, just to recap some of the best practices and top recommendations that we covered today, first and foremost, make the most out of your current equipment. So all of your park set uh, equipment has very valuable data in there. That's going to help you understand when are people coming, how long are they staying, uh, getting access to that data and using it to inform decision making and implement uh, uh, different demand based strategies, either from a staffing or pricing perspective, um, is our number one top recommendation. Second thing we wanted to talk about uh, is obviously uh, skating to where the puck is going. Uh, we see that stronger recovery in online relative to drive up. Um, definitely thinking critically about how we price and allocate inventory online, making sure that we're not cannibalizing drive up or from one channel to the other uh, has been something that uh, we spend a lot of time digging into the data on and making sure that all of our revenues are accretive. Um, uh, AIM is a fantastic tool uh, to leverage in order to make sure that you're constantly up to date on the optimal rate structure for each of the unique de demand patterns associated with your locations. Last but not least, this is just sort of the bread and butter at ABM, right? You can't manage what you don't measure, uh, really leveraging data to inform all sorts of decisions. Uh, ABM has been a leader in leveraging the industry benchmark, not only to, in understanding sort of where the market is and where it's likely to be going, but how each location is performing against the market and putting in uh, best practices uh, in order to double down what's on what's working and uh, adjust where needed. So, um, Matt. Brian, Stan, thank you so much for walking through this fantastic content with us today. Uh, let's see how much more time we've got here. We've got just 17 minutes left, a bunch of different questions. Uh, I see one here directed specifically to you, Mr. Brian Bush. Uh, this comes from our friend Ed Simmons at the Parking REIT. Ed asks you, do you think there will be a long-term shift away from mass transit or carpooling 
um, because of the mandates around social distancing. Any thoughts for Ed, Brian? I think there'll, there's definitely going to be a, a shift. I don't know if it's going to be long term or not. It's going to be how well does the transit world deliver their safe message to consumers. But for the foreseeable future, I, I see that as a as an alternative. There'll be more people driving or people that were traditionally taking mass transportation will be back, be back into an automobile. And I foresee that till the end of this fiscal year. Got it. Thanks. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, let's see here. Let me just read through this, make sure I understand it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, throw this one up to the field. So this is a tricky question. It uh, does not speak to my expertise. Uh, this is from Mr. Dennis Cunning. Dennis asks, typically monthly parking is sold in advance to an individual knowing that there is a space, i.e. there is a built-in vacancy factor. Uh, what is your position on sharing a monthly space with multiple parkers? Is that something that you guys would recommend? Matt, Stan, or Brian, I'll, I'll let you guys bite on that one. I think you have to look at that as the future. As, as you know, anything's on the table, right? It all depends on multiple things. It depends on the type of the facility, the demand. Um, and also we, in many cases, we're representing working with our clients for the buildings. We're, we're managing that asset to the best of their, uh, to, to what they need best for them. That's the bottom line. And if that means some of their tenants need to share spaces, do that, we'll do that. If it makes sense where we have a high demand garage and we can flexibly accommodate more people, and there's an opportunity to generate additional revenue as well as accommodate more people. I think it's always a delicate balance, but I think that's something that most people are going to be looking at in some way, shape, or form in the future uh, as we go on and, and look at people are, you know, the remote working is great for a while. Actually, I don't think it's that great. I want to go back to the office. Um, I'm getting sick of being at home, uh, but I don't think everybody's going to go back five days a week either. And, and, right. and again, you know, I think that's the thing, again, flexibility is key with that. And and I'm always, and even when uh, the, the previous question was asked, do you think there'll be a shift? I'm, I'm always hesitant to talk in absolutes and concretes, right? Things evolve and move over time. This is going to be an interesting year to figure that stuff out. We had a pandemic 100 years ago, you know, up until the last year, we didn't wear masks and do all these other things, right? Things just cycle through. And after a while, you kind of go back to the normal. And I know I live in Los Angeles and right now, I take my car everywhere, but once the traffic, before this happened, traffic was mind numbing, just absolutely mind numbing. And the thought of getting in the car for most people is like, I'm gonna take mass transit. It'll get there again and people will feel safe and they'll go, I'm not gonna do this again. So just know that whatever we're talking about is it's all fluid and it's, it's all kind of in a, in a, a moving over. And I, I suspect in a few years, by you know, 2023, 24, a lot of what we, we're thinking are changes are gonna probably be back to what we've been seeing before. I agree, Stan. We're seeing some requests now where there's large groups of employee parking for large corporations that they're trying to determine what they're going to do. And there's, you know, some locations have a lot of must-take agreements that there's a lot of tenants that are up in arms about because they're, they're, they're required to pay for their parking if they're using them or not. So there's a lot of discussion about, well, we want, we have 300, we want to buy 300 spaces, but give us 500 cars. And once, once you know, the, the, the first person over that limit, then there's a different rate structure that kicks in. There's going to be a lot more of that type of request. Yep. I think uh, creativity is key, too. I, I think now, more than anything, you know, our, our monthly parkers and uh, the corporations that are paying for monthly spaces and even individuals are looking for more options. And having, uh, you know, technology in place, having uh, a platform, to build that off of is more important than ever. And it's it's really coming down to creativity. And then as Stan mentioned, each garage is a little bit unique on how they, they uh, lease their spaces and how the monthly parkers use the spaces. But uh, you know, we're, we're at that point in time where um, you know, we can usually come up with a solution to make it as easy as possible and keep those monthly parkers in, in our locations. Thanks so much. There's a there's a handful of questions here around the dynamic pricing engine. I'm sort of just gonna um, group these all together. Uh, the first question is sort of which channels can we do dynamic pricing on? Uh, presently, our uh, our launch partner on the program is Arrive. The good folks at Arrive on the ParkWiz channel actively looking to expand that and add additional channel partners. 
uh, to the system over time. I like to say Rome was not built in a day. Uh, and then the second question resulted uh, around some uh, laws in New York City around changing rates. Um, our, our thought process is because uh, all of those, for the most part, are discounts to, to board rates. Sometimes we do charge more and that uh, the, uh, the nature of an online reservation is one that provides the parker with a tremendous amount of price transparency, right? i.e. they agree to the price before they book, um, that it's a 100% fair uh, uh, transaction. Uh, we've been running AIM in New York City for, gosh, three years now uh, and have had any, any complaints. Um, there's another question around whether we're doing dynamic pricing from a drive up perspective and using electronic signage. Uh, Jeff, I, I think we're gonna get there. Uh, just going back to sort of Rome was not built in, an, in a day. One of the things about dynamic pricing that we think is sort of a precursor to being adopted is uh, price transparency, right? So Uber, Lyft, airlines, hotels, you're always getting that price before you book. Uh, it's a little bit tough to implement in a, in a drive up uh, environment. Uh, and so that's our, fo our efforts are really focused on uh, online for now where the consumer does have uh, that price transparency. Um, another question from Mr. Dennis Cunning, and, and this one's uh, asking us to uh, prognosticate on the future of the New York City subway. So I don't know uh, how, how uh, whether folks are uh, experts on this, but I'll go ahead and ask, um, what do we think right now the New York City Clubway, which is infamously run 24 seven, uh, is, is closed overnight um, for cleaning? Uh, obviously making sure that there's uh, good safety protocols in place. Do you foresee the subway coming back to 24 uh, seven when there's no other major cities in the world that are that are doing that? Any thoughts on that? I would, I mean, Ryan, if you're on my, I would think so. I mean, not right now. I mean, obviously it's it's based on like everything. Uh, if you go to New York, a lot of, uh, you know, is not, a lot of things aren't open. It's not the 24 hour city and people, you know, there's outdoor dining and what have you, but it's not, New York as we know it from before. And that's why it makes sense to, to pivot and do that. And that's the time to be cautious and keep the subways clean. I mean, we don't run subways. I can't talk to mass transit to that effect. But I imagine like anything, when things start opening up more, it's just going to make more sense to open that up. And they'll figure it out through their, you know, New York, New York Transit, probably Port Authority could t to answer that a little bit better than I could. But I, I think I think eventually you're going to see that that all come back for sure. It's just... Yeah, I think some of the changes that we've seen uh, due to COVID protocols, I think they're going to stick around far yeah, more than COVID's over. So some yeah. of these things are going to stick around, best practices, if you want to call that, and, and that may include the subway. Uh, you know, I don't want to be predictive on that, but it's all about their product and what they're going to do to make their customers feel safe. Awesome. And, and Cash, I will say one yeah. thing when people are talking about the things going back to, 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 you know, I'd say things will kind of go back in a few years. But I do think the idea of, uh, you know, touchless, frictionless, that's here to not only here to stay, it's going to ramp up. That That's right. going to be an online presence. A lot of what you're going to see is people are going to do a lot and lot and lot more, which we were already going to. You're going to see this will be the byproduct of it that people have embraced it so much more and understand the capabilities of it if they didn't as much. And I think that's just going to be the future that's going to be incorporated. So even if we go back to quote unquote normal of what we used to before, it will be in a different format of a frictionless, uh, contactless uh, phone credential world. Right. Um, I think this is the last question that we've got here, and it's a good one. Uh, Mr. Stephen Belton asks uh, to share your thoughts on having your own branded online reservation portal relative to working with a third party. I think, uh, oh, I've got some thoughts to share, but uh, anyone from the ABM team uh, wanna, wanna uh, take a stab at this one? Any Share some thoughts on having your own reservation channel versus a third party? Well, I, I think for me uh, and, and ABM, we definitely uh, think there's a lot of value there. Uh, again, yep. you know, we we would like to convert as many people to use use our platform, and we can better serve the customer. Uh, we know more of their data, we know about their usage, and we can make things more customizable for them. Uh, you know, I, I kind of see this entire experience as an opportunity. Um, yep. As Brian mentioned earlier, that we were seeing um, some consumers that are parking that maybe didn't park with us in the past, and 
and finding ways to make it um, um, parking is, a, is an asset that it, they don't want to go back to public transportation, I think stems through those things like having our own custom application and really catering to our customers. Right. Yeah, I, uh, just just to uh, add, add to that, Matt, you know, in our view, um, we almost think of it as inevitable, right? I mean, our, our thoughts in, at Smarking are always taking a look at some, some of these more mature, more digitized industries like airlines and hotels. And, you know, Marriott sells inventory on Expedia and, and Priceline, but they've also got the Marriott.com, you know, and so uh, that's the way that that we see things going. And, you know, to be perfectly candid with you, I think as an industry, uh, we owe it to consumers to digitize as quickly as possible. I mean, the convenience of buying something from a digital uh, platform relative to physical is sort of um, uh, undoubtable. And so I think the more the more digital options uh, we can provide consumers, uh, the better for the consumer, which is at the end of the day, good for the industry as well. So um, definitely a big fan of uh, uh, thinking critically about generating your own online reservations. Gentlemen, we have uh, mm -hmm. expired all of the, uh, unless there's additional thoughts to add there. Nope, doesn't sound like it. Folks, no. um, go ahead, Matt. Uh, well, I was just going to make make one comment and, and yeah, yeah. just kind of what I said from previous point, and I, I'm sure a lot of people have a similar experience, but, you know, I, I, there's a couple of things I like in it, too, um, and why it's an opportunity for us is that um, I'm sure people have used Grubhub or DoorDash and, and um, you know, sometimes just having your information in one place and ordering food, is, it just makes it easier to go through that process. And that's why it's important right. for us to, you know, have a platform that people can go to. And, you know, I kind of go out of my way to do it myself. If I can't uh, use my Apple watch to do a tap and pay, um, you know, I I may avoid that store if I know I can do it across the street at another store. Right. So okay. that, that store kind of earns my loyalty because they do that, even if they charge a dollar more for, uh, yep. for, for Rice Krispie treat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd still rather go there and, and be able to just use a touch-free option to do it. hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Um, Brian, Stan, Matt, thank you so much, uh, thank for you. taking some time to, to present with us today. Uh, just a really longstanding partnership, a lot of work sort of, uh, all the, all the way up to now. And, and you guys have just been fantastic, uh, partners to work with. Uh, thanks so much for for being willing to to share some of these strategies uh, with the, the folks on today's webinar. Um, I know you guys are big fans of advancing the industry cause, and um, just your your willingness to be leaders on this front is 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 admirable. So thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I believe that where we're going to record this webinar, I know my my wonderful colleague Sarah in in marketing uh, probably be. Uh, emailing out uh, some summary notes and uh, links to the recording. So um, if we can be helpful, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, you can connect with ABM at abm.com forward slash parking resource center. We've got uh, Stan's email there for you there. Any questions for ABM, go ahead and get in touch. Uh, any questions that you have on the smarting side, head over to our website, www.smarting.com or send me an email, Cassius at smarting.com. Thanks so much for joining everyone. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys. Our Thank pleasure. you. Thank you for including us. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. sure thing.